Okay, got it. And go to full screen. Okay, good. So it seems like we got there without too much trouble. So remember guys, we're still talking about governmental accounting. We are still focusing on the governmental funds. We are focusing on what makes the governmental funds unique and what makes them unique from what we're used to from regular commercial accounting is the modified accrual approach in which we're not capitalizing assets, we're not recording long-term debt, et cetera. We talked about that generically um, for you know, the back part of chapter eight, first few parts as we talked about encumbrances for chapter nine. And then we started seeing how that applied to the various um, governmental funds. We looked at the general fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund. Now we're on the capital project fund. So all we're trying to tease out here is how modified accrual accounting looks inside of these various governmental funds that we're looking at now, starting tonight with the capital project fund, okay? So if you take a look, we can see that uh, governments have to accumulate resources and they'll accumulate them in a capital project fund for the construction of assets that will be used by the grass funds only, okay? If we are constructing assets that were to be used by any of the other funds, then that would be accounted for specifically in those funds. But if we're having a general use asset, for example, a county courthouse is a good example, then the resources are gonna be accumulated in the capital project fund. The capital project fund will then use those resources, spend them out to construct whatever this long-term capital project is, okay? So we start looking at revenue and other financing sources and really, most of the money is going to come into a capital project fund by being transferred in from other funds. And remember, when we talk about other financing sources, there are two other financing sources, long-term debt proceeds and transfers in. There's only one other financing use. That's what, that's the transfer out. We're going to really see that we're going to be focusing mostly here on other financing sources coming into this capital project fund in order for these resources to be available uh, for the construction of a capital asset, okay? Now you come over and they talk about capital grants. What happens here? Now this is a revenue. Capital grant is going to be a revenue, okay? And it's a revenue when say a um, higher level of government, say the federal government passes money down to a lower level of government, say a county, okay? Now, if the money comes in and there's no restrictions as to time or eligibility, then of course it is revenue as soon as it comes in, okay? Now, if there is some sort of restriction, in other words, we are not eligible for that money yet, then that would be considered a liability, a revenue collected in advance. Notice we don't call it unearned revenue. Okay, or I should say we don't call it deferred revenue. You can call it unearned. You can't call it deferred because we say that the, the D word for deferred inflow, but if there's some sort of restriction, we are not eligible yet, then it's going to be a liability called revenue collected in advance. Now, sometimes the restriction will be that we really haven't earned the revenue until we actually spend the money. So if this is the case, they gave us some money up front. They said, well, you really haven't earned the money until you spend the money. We go ahead and we spend those funds. Then when we spend those funds, we can go ahead and debit revenue collected in advance and credit the revenue. That's assuming they gave us the cash in advance of us spending it here, but we weren't really eligible for that money until we started spending out. Conversely, you could bill them after you've already spent the money, in which case the debit, the journal entry here would be a debit to, you know, grant receivable and a collection to revenue. Okay, here they just presume that they got the money in advance of actually spending it. They weren't eligible until they spent it. They spent it, then they could take the revenue. Question? Okay, good. Now there's also something called special assessment. What happens here? 
Well, let's say I go to a particular neighborhood and I say, you know, we're going to put street lights in over here. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to assess the tax holders just in that neighborhood where we're going to be putting in the street lights. Well, if that's the case, that's called a special assessment. Now, we're going to have to get the money to put in the street lights. So let's say we issue debt. If we issue debt and the government is potentially or primarily liable for that debt for those street lights, then we're going to go ahead and we're going to account for that in the capital project fund. The money comes into the capital project fund. We spend that money out constructing the street lights. If for whatever reason <clears throat> um, we're not able to pay back those bondholders, the government will step up and cover that debt. Let's say, you know, there's some sort of depression or something and the taxpayers are walking on their property and they're not paying for their property taxes, then the government will step up and pay that debt. In some cases, we're going to see that the special assessment, the government is just doing a favor by collecting that money on, perhaps on behalf of the property holders and then paying that out to the bondholders. If that's the case, we're gonna keep track of that debt in the, uh, that, that activity, I should say, in the capital project fund, okay? Not the capital project fund, but in the, um, custodial fund. So special assessment are defined as taxes or fees levied against property owners who will benefit directly from the project, say streetlights. Okay. Now, when the government is primarily or potentially liable for the assessment, the debt, the governmental unit should account for the construction of the asset in the capital project fund and any related debt will go through the appropriate debt service fund for that. So you can go ahead and flashcard that. What happens when the government is potentially primarily liable? That is going to be accounted for in the capital project fund, debt in the debt service fund. Now, conversely, if the government is not potentially or primarily liable, okay, if that's the case, here, the government is really act, acting like a custodian in which they will go ahead and they will take the money from the property holders and do a favor to those property holders and hand that over to the bondholders. Then that transaction should all be accounted for in a custodial fund. And we'll look at the custodial funds here a little bit later, but why don't you just go ahead and flashcard. Government potentially primary liable, special assessment, account for that in the capital project fund government not potentially primary liable account for that in the uh, custodial fund. Okay. All right, good. Now let's go over and let's just start to take a look at this capital project fund journal entries example. And we issue bonds for 2 million. As is often the case with uh, government, state and local government bonds, they're issued at a premium. So they're issued for 2,080,000. Now notice that we take all the cash initially into the capital project fund. And then we have the other financing sources. And here they just made it two separate line items, other financing source, the principal part, the premium part. And remember when we talked about the debt service fund last time, and that was on page 24, we saw that the money would then for the premium, that money would be transferred into the debt service fund. So that's what we do here. We have an OFU is other financing use, interfund transfer out to the debt service fund, credit the cash. And we saw on page 24, that money comes into the debt service fund as they transfer that money over uh, for the premium. Now, in this example, they assumed that this government wasn't ready to begin construction right away. So they took the two million, invested it in something very safe, not junk bonds, T-bills or a CD or whatever it is. And they earned $40,000 on that. So we're going to go ahead, of course, we debit the investment, credit the cash for the, I mean, yeah, yeah for the uh, amount that gets invested in the CD. And then when the interest comes in, debit cash, credit interest income. And then they're going to take that money because often what the debt covenant will say is any money that is earned on funds that aren't being used and are invested will be passed over to the protection of bondholders. 
And so now this money goes also to the debt service fund. It'll be debit to other finance and use, credit to cash. And again, we saw the other side of that journal entry on page 24 uh, when we looked at the debt service fund last time. Question? Okay, good. Now you come over and we start now spending that money out of the capital project fund. And unlike what we said for the debt service fund for the capital project fund, yes, you must use the encumbrance accounting. So if they sign a contract for the construction of this item, they have to debit encumbrances and credit the budgetary control. And then if we get billed for some amount, in this example, 600,000, just as we saw before when we talked about encumbrances, remember for the two sanitation trucks, you debit the uh, budgetary control, credit encumbrance for the encumbered amount. And then in this example, since the contract wasn't done yet, we had the same amount for our expenditure. Remember, if the expenditure actual amount is different than the amount we encumbered, we reverse the encumbrance for the original encumbrance amount and debit expenditure and vouchers payable or cash for the actual. But here, there is no difference between the two numbers. Question. One of the things that has been confusing me as I've been studying this is what exactly what kind of an account is the budgetary control account? If I was looking on a general ledger, would I find it with the balance sheet type accounts or would I find it with the income statement type accounts? Well, all budgetary control and encumbrances are budgetary accounts. So you wouldn't see it either place. Yeah, but I mean, are they... Uh, I guess what I'm saying, I'm trying to just figure out if there, if there were assets get put or where income and expenses get put. You know what I'm saying? Where that, I don't know if, I'm, if my question makes any sense, but. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. But because I it's, it's make... troubling for me when I'm trying to figure out if I'm increasing it or decreasing it when I'm debiting or decrediting it, crediting it. Okay, well, first of all, you know, when you start asking me, are they balance sheet or are they revenue accounts? I want to make sure balance sheet and income statement accounts are real accounts, right? Mm -hmm. These are budgetary accounts. Right. I got so that much. So they're neither, but if they, ne they neither will generate uh, entries that construct the balance sheet nor the income statement. So I want to start with that. Um, but if I had to tie them more closely to an income statement account or a balance sheet account, they are income statement accounts, okay? And they are indicating uh, approved uh, money that we plan to spend here. Yeah, okay. so so it's an it's basically an earmark relative to the income statement, essentially, right? It's money that we're spending out of our appropriation that we have that we are approved to spend, but we haven't received delivery of the goods yet. Right. So, so we're I just had, marking it so that we don't accidentally spend it for something else. Correct. So I'm going to assume I have two, I have, um, well, I'll just assume I have 1,100,000 in appropriation. Mm -hmm. So when I had set this thing up, I had a credit to my appropriation of 1,100,000. And now I go ahead and I put in an encumbrance, right, of uh, 1,100,000. So now, which is a debit, right? So now yeah. I know that the balance is zero. So appropriation is like approved spending, right? You could almost call it an estimated expenditure. Okay. So if I had to debit encumbrances, encumbrances is kind of covering that estimated spending I have. So I would put it as a spending account, yeah, you know, more towards an expense account if I had to, you know, tie it to an income mm -hmm. statement account expense. Because then when I'm actually getting ready to just spend the money, I debit the budgetary control, I credit the encumbrance. And when I credit the encumbrance here for 600,000, that of course brings it down. And I left off a column here, which is very important, which is expense. 
the expense gets debited for 600,000 and now this is back to zero, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think what was confusing me was I was trying to figure out whether debits or credits increased or decreased these things and I got myself all turned around. <laughs> Okay, well, encumbrances, you know, before this whole thing got started, encumbrances would have been zero, right? Exactly. And so you're increasing an encumbrance account with a debit. And then are you increasing an, a budget, uh, the budgetary control account with a credit? Is that what you're doing? You increase budgetary control with a, with a credit, right? Okay. All right. That's, but, yeah, I was just... <laughs> Like, but bud oh. control is really more or less just a placeholder. Okay. You know, because what was it? Budgetary control was 1100000 Because by the end of the year, let's say this year ended and I hadn't received everything yet. At the end of the year, I would still debit bud control right? Because over here, I went ahead and I debited it for 600000 So it has now a balance of 500000 Right. So I still would debit budgetary control 500000 credit the encumbrance account for 500000 because when I credited it for six, there was still 500 left. I put another 500. Those are all closed now, aren't they? Right, you have to clear it out at the year end, right? Right, and then I would debit, um, you know, well, I don't know that this would have an unassigned fund balance. Um, I'd but have you, to- Whatever the mechanism was to move it over to the next year, if it was continuing for the next year and valid for the next year, then that's the thing that you would do, right? Yeah, I don't think I need to do the fund balance entry here because okay. everything that comes in to the capital project fund is automatically restricted anyway. Right. So it's not like I need to now show some other amount because it's all sitting in the restricted category fund balance anyway. So I okay. just have to make sure and close the budgetary account. So there are holding accounts. Okay. Their encumbrance is increased by a debit, budgetary control is increased by a credit, vice versa. The budgetary control is decreased by debit, encumbrance is decreased by a credit. And I think it's more important that you kind of understand the process as you're going through and spending the money out and how it's achieving the budgetary control through this process. Yeah, that was helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right. Um, so let's go ahead then and let's just take a look at short term borrowing. And guys, I find this a little annoying um, in here. You know, I don't think the exam is going to get to this level of specificity. Okay. But if you have a short term borrowing, might be necessary to start the project either before bond proceeds or other revenue are received. And if it's a bond anticipation note, in other words, we're thinking we're gonna get the money through the bond pretty soon. And then we take that money in and we have a short term loan, we would credit other financing sources if it's on a bond anticipation note, okay? If it's just short term financing, okay? Um, because, you know, it's some sort of revenue anticipation note, then we go ahead and we can credit our uh, short-term liability, tax or revenue anticipation note payable, okay? So it's annoying, different treatments, depending on whether it's a bond anticipation note or a revenue anticipation note. Revenue anticipation note treats as a short-term liability, bond anticipation note, treat the money that comes in as another financing source. It's one of those annoying things. You got a couple of flashcards on it. I wouldn't trip too much on that, okay? Okay, good. Now we've already seen closing entries, guys. You close your appropriations. You close all your actual activity. You close any outstanding encumbrances. And I kind of already showed you that journal entry there a couple of minutes ago. 
Okay, so just remember those closing entries. We talked about that in the context of the um, of the uh, general fund, uh, you know, a couple times ago or last class maybe. Okay, all of the governmental funds prepare a balance sheet and a statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. Okay, as I had mentioned to you, you know, all of the funds in the capital project fund are really generally considered restricted for that capital project. And then we have the monies coming in, the amount that was spent, the expenditures, the capital outlays, we had some interest revenue for that CD. We had the what other financing source, which is the money that came in from the bond, the transfer out, and then the net change in fund balance, et cetera. Every governmental fund has to prepare these two statements, a balance sheet and the statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance. Okay, question. All right, let's look at, I'm going to get past that. Let's look at the permanent fund, which is the second P in grasp. So this is our last governmental fund, and we have the permanent fund. Okay, so what happens? Let's say that um, the great granddaughter of William Haywards, William Haywards is the person who started Hayward. Let's say she comes to the city of Hayward and says, look, I want a park um, erected in the middle of the city. And I want some, you know, statues put up of my great grandfather and a little plaque and da, 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 da. And the city says, we'd love to do that, but we don't have the funds for it. She says, look, she reaches into her bank account. She says, here's $200,000. Hang on to the $200,000 principal forever, but any earnings, interest, et cetera, you can use to run the park. City says, okay. The city will account for that activity in the permanent fund. And it's a very descriptive name in that the permanent fund is set up so that only earnings and not principal may be used for whatever the purpose is. Okay. Now, when we look at that, we have revenue sources, and it can be investment earnings, expenditure types, whatever. If you want to, you know, think about a public cemetery or something, cemetery maintenance, park maintenance, whatever. Okay. Now, since we are only spending the principal, we, I mean, <laughs> the interest and not the principal, we do not have to use encumbrances for the permanent fund. We also said that we don't use encumbrances for reoccurring expenditures. Therefore, since interest and principal on debt is a reoccurring on schedule expenditure, you don't use encumbrances for the debt service fund. For the general fund, special revenue fund, for the capital project fund, as we've seen, yeah, do use encumbrance accounting unless it's even out of those funds for a recurring expenditure like salaries, then you don't have to use encumbrances, okay? And then, as we said last time, you can make a flashcard out of this pass key for the special revenue fund. You spend all the money, both principal and interest, for the permanent fund, as we've seen. And now I'm asking you a flashcard. You should only uh, spend the uh, interest only. Do not spend the principal out of the permanent fund. And the description is, you know, the, the title is very descriptive. Okay. All right, good. With that, let's start to take a look. Carly going to give us some questions for a couple of our uh, funds here, our capital project fund, maybe our debt service fund, maybe our permanent fund. So let's see which machine is going to be applicable for the poll. Good. Looks like it's the main machine, so that helps. And let's take a look at this first question.
Okay, guys, let's go ahead and make your best shot here. And um, let's take a look at this one. And good, about 75% of us got this question right. And what they're really asking us to do is can I tease out which of these are revenue versus which of these would be considered and uh, the others are considered financing source, right? So capital project fund for new city county recorded as a receivable 300,000 for a straight grant, okay? A grant is what? A grant is revenue. Once you've earned that grant by meeting the eligibility and any time requirements that might be associated with that grant, then you can take that as a revenue, okay? Now, if you were still confused, well, it's a state grant revenue, and you then looked and saw, well, look, there's a $450,000 transfer, you'd say to yourself, well, wait a minute, there's only two things that are what? That are an other financing source, long-term debt proceeds and what? Transfer in. I had you make that flashcard, right? So the transfer in is not a revenue, it is what? It is an other financing source. So the only one that qualifies as a revenue here is what? Is what most of us chose the 300,000. The 450,000 is not revenue. Revenue is revenue. Other financing source is not revenue. It's a different number. It's a different item, line item on the statement of revenues, expenditures, and changing the fund balance. Question? Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's just take a look at this next one. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the poll here, not only because um, we've gone through the two minutes, but because I just don't like this question, okay? Um, half of us got it right. The answer is A, but it's pretty annoying question uh, in that we haven't told you anything in here about how to handle bond issue costs. Uh, how to handle an underwriting fee, et cetera, okay? Now, um, I guess the idea was that you should have known the answer to this by knowing that things like debt issue cost and underwriter fees are going to back off the total proceeds that you're gonna get on the issue of this debt. And it's the job of the debt service fund to cover amounts that are less than whatever the face is 
of this um, bond, okay? But that would have required you to really, you know, make a pretty informed leap there, a uh, pretty big leap that we, for which we didn't inform you. Now, if they tell you it's a million dollar bond and they issued it at 101, then you would take the 1 million times the 1.01, and that comes out to what? $1,010,000? Am I doing my math right? Okay. Now, if that's 1,010,000, then what they're going to do is credit other financing sources, bond proceeds, for $1,010,000, right? That's a credit, okay? Which is the answer to this question. What is the amount of the other financing sources? But they're not gonna receive the full 1,010,000 in cash because the underwriters and the issue costs and everything, they're gonna take that off the top, right? So if you take the 1,010,000 and you subtract off the 2,000 plus the 2,500, you subtract off 2,500, that means from this bond issue, they're going to do what? They're going to net 1,007,500, right? Okay, so I'm gonna debit the cash for 1,700,500. Now I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, but who really was supposed to have paid those underwriting fees and those um, bond issue costs, it's the debt service fund. So they kind of owe me that money. So I'm going to debit due from DSF is the debt service fund for the $2,500. Now, what happens? Amounts though in excess of the face need to be sent over to what? to the debt service fund, don't they? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go ahead and credit the cash. And this is beyond what they're contemplating in this question. They're gonna credit the cash for 7,500, okay? They're going to go ahead and what? Credit do from debt service fund. I don't know why I'm writing debt service fund there. Credit due from debt service fund for 2,500. That cleared that out. And then debit, what? Other financing use transfer out for 10,000. So now they're just sending over what was net left after the payment for the um, bond issue cost and the underwriting fees because the debt service fund would have had to pay that anyway, right? And so they didn't get the full 10000 on the premium. They only got 7500 And then, of course, in the debt service fund, they will do what? They will uh, debit the cash for the full 7500 Credit what? Credit transfer in for the 10,000 and debit, and I'm assuming they would have set up a due to, um, or I should say do, yeah, do to uh, capital project fund at the time when that 2,500 came up. Okay, question. Most important thing is what? The amount that was supposed to come in on that bond issue, that goes what? That's another financing source, period. Okay. You know, I don't think you see a lot of questions that start throwing little curveballs in there like that. I reckon that question came up on the CPA exam and Becker decided because it had some weird wrinkles in it to go ahead and put it here to help make you generally aware of a question that might have a wrinkle. Look, I'm here to tell you guys, you ain't gonna get 100 on the exam, okay? And so there will be questions that will have something odd. You just roll with it as best you can, okay? Do not sit there 
and put your studying into a tizzy here by saying, oh man, look at this question too. I don't understand what's going on in governmental. Keep your mind on the big chunks of things that we've talked about, okay? Don't sit there and try to be ready for every single little granular thing. And so I question Becker's wisdom in putting that here as one of our class questions, although I get it that maybe they wanted us to have the conversation we're having right now about the nuance like this. Okay, all right, good. Let's go ahead and let's look at this next question. Okay, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and end this poll a little sooner since it was just a matter of reading this question and seeing uh, which fund uh, you think this activity would account for. And since they're maintaining that principle uh, indefinitely, although in this case, the principle is land, that would appropriately be accounted for in the permanent fund. Um, special, so most of us got that right. A uh, special revenue fund, no, uh, that's not a special revenue fund activity because special revenue fund, we spend the revenue and there's generally not a, and you can spend any principal that's included in that special revenue fund. And there's no anticipation that we would maintain some asset in perpetuity. That's the permanent fund. Okay, good. Um, Okay, any question on that one? Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's continue on. And now we are done with the governmental funds. So we have now spent the time understanding what makes the governmental fund special, which is the use of modified accrual accounting and the use of the budgetary accounts, right? So that is the core of what you've got to get down for this governmental section of your CPA exam, which is going to constitute about 20 points, 20 points, 20 points, most of it focusing on what we've just covered, okay? But we need to spend a little bit of time here now making sure that we understand more the nature of the activity that's going to happen in our proprietary funds and then our fiduciary funds. So let's go ahead and start to jump into that, starting with our proprietary funds starting with our internal service funds. So remember we have two proprietary funds. We have the what? We have the internal service fund enterprise fund. We're going to start with the internal service fund here. And I gave you the example here sort of um, you know a while back when we started talking about governmental central motor pool. All city vehicles go to be worked on by the central motor pool. And the notion here is, is that this um, internal service fund is simply trying to uh, trying to cover its cost. So it sits there and it charges the other funds for the service that's being provided. And they are sitting there trying to make this gigantic, you know, profit on this thing. They're not sitting there saying, well, since you have to bring all your vehicles to me, let me run up this big profit. 
they are just there to cover cost. Okay, but it is other than that, it's sort of like a business in which the service is being provided, and um, the other funds are being charged for that service. So we use full accrual accounting. We only use modified accrual accounting for the governmental funds. For all the other funds, we use full accrual accounting, and we're going to have revenue sources. And if it's a restricted grant, we would only recognize the revenue when money is spent. And this is really, guys, um, you guys heard of Tim Ger Garrity? Tim Garrity has ultimate decision about things that are included in here. And when I talked to Tom and asked him, why are you writing this in here? Why don't you just call it a reimbursement grant? He says, because Tim said he wanted it to be presented this way. So I'm stuck doing this, okay? But this is a reimbursement type grant. And again, in order to be eligible for that money, you have to what? You have to have spent the money to be eligible. So the what, revenue will be recognized when you spend the money. So you literally have a debit to expenditure and a credit to cash, a debit to um, either grant receivable or a debit to cash and a credit to revenue as those monies are spent, okay? Now, more interestingly here, operating revenue, okay? And operating revenue is for billing when earned, when you provide the service. So notice guys that billings flashcard is the name for the operating revenue account. And I ask you to flashcard that because you might think of billings might sound like a receivable, right? If you don't think about it carefully or in the context of the internal service fund, no billings is a revenue account. Make sure you've got this the name of the operating revenue account. And then we don't debit accounts receivable, we debit what, either cash, of course, or due from. So flashcard that, that when one fund is going to be receiving money from another fund, we don't call it receivable, we call it due from, okay? But it's like accounts receivable, we call it due from, okay? Now, since it's an operating revenue, it is like our day-to-day -day activity, okay? Uh, but we can also have non-operating revenue and non-operating revenue classic is interest, just like it was in F1, just like it would be for commercial, right? Okay, that's going to be considered non-operating, okay? Operating expenses are day-to-day -day expenses for the delivery of services. And let's just put in here mechanics salary. Look, if you're going to have a motor pool, you got to pay a mechanic, don't you? Okay. And so that mechanic salary would be an example of a day to day expense that would be considered an operating expense. Non operating classic example is interest expense. So this is sounding familiar to you. It should because it's really going through the context of what we said about the income statement way back in F1 operating items, non operating items, right? Okay. Now, when you establish an internal service fund, okay, if it is being established by contribution from other funds, okay, then there'll be a debit to cash and a credit to inner fund transfer. That is if the money is not going to be paid back, that shows up on the income statement. If they are giving some assets over, then that's going to be set up as a contribution that shows up on the income statement, okay? So make sure you flashcard that inner fund transfers show up on the income statement for an internal service fund, okay? Now, if we are issuing bonds, then inside the internal service fund, they're issuing bonds for the, for the purchase of assets and whatnot that'll be used to establish this internal service fund, that is a long-term bond payable. We are sitting here and we are on full accrual accounting now. So for the debt issued by the internal service fund, yes, you do credit bond payable. If it was being debt that was being issued out of one of the governmental funds, then that long-term debt is another financing source. Question on that? Okay, so you gotta, Think through yeah. 
What fund am I in when you're treating the treatment of long-term debt? Uh -huh. I have a question about contributions. Is it classed as a contribution only if what is being transferred is assets? Because I was a little confused between contributions and interfund transfers to us, like of cash to establish a fund. Um, if it's a non-reciprocal transfer, right, which is what this is, because they don't have to give the money back. Yeah. It's a transfer. It's just a if, transfer. If it's just money that's just sort of, and it doesn't have to just be, they're, they're saying asset here, probably it's cash, that's just being given by the capital project fund, then they say they're contributing it, then it'd be a contribution. I don't know what to tell you. Okay. It's All right. word, the, the discussion. Okay. Okay. Okay, good. Come over. And if they're borrowing money um, on a sh um, from one of the other funds, then they're going to go ahead and debit cash and credit due to the other fund. Again, when one fund is lending money or has a liability from another fund, they don't credit accounts payable. They credit due to. Okay, so we've had due from, due to. Remember those phrases. The financial statement for the um, um, internal service fund for the proprietary funds, okay? The statement of net position is like the balance sheet. Right, and so you have both current and non-current assets, full accrual accounting guys. Going over to the next page, current and non-current liabilities, full accrual accounting, and then net position, okay, is broken into three categories, restricted, unrestricted, and net invested in capital assets. And I'm giving you the mnemonic here, run, so that you can use that to remember the categories of net position. Now notice that what, for the, um, for the internal service fund, for both enterprise funds, for both uh, proprietary funds, we show what, uh, we show the net position as a what, as the bottom line. We don't add the liabilities of the net position to gross up to the assets like we do for our uh, governmental fund. Okay, so this is assets. Let's just write in the numbers. Let's just do it. I think it's helpful. Okay, the assets are what? Total current assets. Uh, total assets are 320. So assets are 320. And then we subtract the liabilities. Liabilities are what? Total liabilities are 157. Difference is going to give us the net position. Net position is 163. And we stop there. We don't add the assets and liabilities back together to get them to total up to the total of the assets. I mean, we don't add the liabilities and net position to get together to get to the total of the assets. I think. You know what I'm talking about. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and you take a look at the enterprise fund. And when you look at the enterprise fund, okay, and the enterprise fund is used to account for activities that have met one of the following criteria. Activity is financed with debt, that will be paid back with a pledge of net revenues from fees and charges. Laws and regulations require the cost of providing the services be recovered through fees. The pricing policy of established fees and charges recover costs. So if you're sitting here and you're trying to you know, think of, well, is there a common theme here, John? Yes, the answer is what? Fees recover cost. Maybe I borrowed the money, but I had to pledge the what net revenues and net income of the enterprise fund to cover those bonds. So it all comes back to fees, doesn't it? Okay. That's what constitutes an enterprise fund. And classic example, 
is a water company, a hospital, um, although some hospitals are purely government hospitals, in which case they would use the governmental fund accounting that we talked about. But most of the time, hospitals are a enterprise fund in that the person receiving the service has to pay some amount, even though it may be county hospital. Um, you know, usually there is some charge that is intended to cover costs, okay? But I don't like focusing on specific examples as much as I like the flashcard here. If the costs are recovered by fees, that's an enterprise fund. Even if there's some money kicked in from other sources, if most of the costs, more than 50% are covered by fees, it's an enterprise fund, okay? The lottery... If someone's stupid enough to play the lottery, yeah, obviously we're gonna finance that uh, through the user charges, right? Okay, good. Um, notice here too, public benefit corporations are accounted for as an enterprise fund. Just flashcard that. That's just something you just got a flashcard. Okay, now when we look at our revenue sources down here, our revenue sources, again, are gonna be operating revenue. And we're going to have what? Charge for service, such as what? Water and sewer, sewer billings, non-operating revenue. Classic example is going to be our interest, okay? Non-operating interest, right? But let's look at this shared revenue, okay? And what happens with shared revenue? Well, let's say we don't have toll roads in California, but... Um, Let's say there's a state gas tax. And then let's say we have several toll roads in that state, like, uh, like uh, Florida. It's got a lot of toll roads. I, thought, I feel they have a lot of toll roads. I mean, coming from California, any state that has more than one toll road feels like they have a lot. But I was in Florida one time for some GAO work. And every time we turn around, we got to throw 47 cents into the thing, 43 cents into the thing, 23 cents into the thing. It's like, how many times are we going to have to do this? Only like eight more times. I'm like, really? OK, so what happens? You sit there. And the gas tax is being collected at the state level. And then they'll go ahead and they'll determine some way of distributing that gas tax to the different toll roads in that uh, state. Well, that is a shared revenue. And that shared revenue would be what? Would be... Um, counted for as a non-operating revenue in the uh, enterprise fund flashcard bet. Okay. Now, as you have expense types, flashcard that, you have expense types and you have operating and you have non-operating. Operating expenses, such as personnel services, utilities, depreciation, day-to-day -day expenses, operating, we're back to F1. Non-operating, classic example is what? Interest expense, okay? Okay, good, now you come over and let's just take a look at um, some of the uh, items that we really have talked about before, contributed capital, okay? Contributed capital is going to be um, from governmental funds or provided to defense. Contributed capital is not shown on the face of the uh, balance sheet. You can flashcard that. Okay. Transfers can come in. Interfund transfers are displayed there as contributions. Transfers, I don't know. Now they're starting to argue with your question here, Kathy, that. Here they're saying our display is contribution. So it does beg the question, is it a transfer, is it a contribution? For the internal service fund, they showed it as two separate items. I would say, hey, they're probably synonymous, transfers from other funds, contributions from other funds. Okay. Okay, good. Capital contributions, okay, as they come in, capital contribution, debit the capital asset credit capital contribution, most important thing that goes on to the income statement, okay, both the transfer 
and capital contributions, even if they are synonymous, they both go to the income statement. And then when you have the bond payable, that's on the balance sheet, that's a when they issue bonds out of the enterprise fund. That's a long-term bond payable because we're on full accrual accounting. Okay, now, when you look at municipal landfill, the dump, okay, what happens here? Well, when you take a look, you, you, do you ever go to a, um, look for a family outing to the dumps? Okay, when I was a kid, that was a big deal. We got to go to the dumps. That was our big summer vacation, right? We're going to go to the dumps and you collect all the stuff sitting there around the house that you want to get rid of and you drive out to the ex outskirts of town and you start getting excited. You know that you're almost there when you get this funky smell in the air, right? And you're like, oh, we're almost there, right? Okay. <laughs> and what happens? There all civilization has been suspended, right? People are throwing stuff off the back. There's seagulls flying everywhere. It's a great family outing, right? So what happens? You sit there and the federal government, the state comes down and they tell the city, don't think you're gonna keep that as a festering hole of garbage. You're gonna have to fill that thing up cap it, put some sort of recreational facility on top of that and monitor it so that if any methane poison gas is sneaking out of that, you can do something to try to collect that poison gas and stuff, right? Well, look, if somebody tells you that you're going to have to spend money to do something, that's called a liability. So what a city dump would have to do is they would have to put cost into a pool. So they'd put all these costs into a pool and they would have to estimate, okay, the cost of the gas man monitoring, the cost of the final capping and covering. Um, and they would need to put those kind of costs into this pool. Cost of equipment that they may need to install to clean this thing up. And they put all those costs into a pool and then what they do is they use that estimate and they adjust it annually and a portion of the estimated cost is recognized an expense and a liability based on usage, okay? So go ahead and flashcard the nature of cost that would go into the pool. But let's just go ahead and let's just use a little numeric example. Let's say I put a million dollars of cost constituted of these items into this pool, right? So what happens then say in the first year that I'm using this, I feel that I can put, you know, 100,000 tons of, you know, garbage in this thing. And so I have 100,000 tons as the denominator, not a quick trick question. Let's say I put what? Let's say I put 20,000 tons. Well, how much of the capacity of that thing has I have I used? Not a trick question. I've used what? 20%. 20%. So take the million times 0.2. And for year one in this example, I would debit what? I would debit expense for 20,000. And I would credit what? The liability for 20,000 because I now know that I have used up that much of that tonnage and the day is coming in which I'm gonna have to what? Cough up this million dollars to clean this thing up, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now it's an estimate. If it's a little bit off at the end, then you'll just adjust it at that time. And that last year, you'll have a bigger expense and then you'll start liquidating that liability as you spend money out to buy these different items whatever it is you need, but just flashcard what goes into the pool. Okay. So the, I have a question. So the pool itself isn't actually booked right away. It's just as you are using the- Right. Yeah, you would need to make an estimate of what you think it is that you're gonna have to spend. You kind of write that number down and then you use that number for the accounting that we're talking about here, which is to set up the expense and liab on the liability based on usage. Got it. Okay. All right, good. 
Now you come over and you take a look at the balance sheet, which is our statement of net position, current and non-current assets, current and non-current liabilities, guys. We have the same three categories of net position that we saw a minute ago. So when you make that flashcard for the internal service fund, it actually would also apply to the um, enterprise fund. And then note, just like it's the same for both uh, proprietary funds, you show the net position as the bottom line, okay? The statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in net position, and um, statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in net position, operating revenue, for example, charge for services, okay? Operating expenses, for example, personnel services, non-operating items, interest is the classic, although you could also have shared revenues there, Okay, well, you know, they're going to go ahead and um, make life difficult on us because sometimes they use the term synonymously and here they're showing them separately. So I get this, the money is transferred. It shows as a transfer. If it's a capital contribution, not a cash item, then show it as a capital contribution. So I guess I stand corrected on that, that if it's capital, Treat it as a, you know, not cash, treat it as capital contribution. If it's cash, I guess, treat it as a transfer. I guess that's what they want us to do there. Yeah, I was, that's how I got confused. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, when I go through this stuff, sometimes I don't pick up those nuances. So I think you're right. If it's a capital contribution, then it shows separately than if it's a cat, you know, a long-term item that's being transferred versus cash being sent over treated as a transfer. The bottom line to me, most important to me here, Kathy, is that they both show up on the income right. statement. Right, um, exactly. The issuance of debt shows up on the balance sheet as a liability long-term. Got it. Okay. Okay, good. And then statement of cash flows, we're gonna get into it more later. Key thing, very important to remember, only the proprietary funds, let me write it right here, only proprietary funds prepare statement of cash flows. And when we get into F10 tonight, I'm going to show you some things about the statement of cash flows for these proprietary funds. Um, but uh, we'll worry about that because that's covered better in chapter 10, but only the proprietary funds prepare the statement of cash flows. No other fund category prepares that. Okay. Okay, good. We'll get more into the statement of cash flows here a little bit uh, into chapter 10. So let's just look at a couple of questions.
Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and um, close the poll here. Okay, and um, looks like a good chunk of us got this right. This is operating revenue. Um, key phrase here, key point here is that they're calling it what? Service provided. Well, that's the operating revenue that generates operating revenue when they provide service. And so that operating revenue, which is called billings, right, um, is what happens in the internal service fund. Okay, good. Let's take a look at question two. Okay, guys, I want to I want to stop you because we're getting a hundred percent answer on the wrong answer. So I don't see any point in uh, you know, kind of spending time spinning our wheels on this. So no, C is not the answer. So let's just let's just look at this one. State government has the following activities, a state operated lottery, a state operated hospital, which of the above activities would likely be accounted for in an enterprise fund? So when do we account for something in an enterprise fund? What compels us to account for something in an enterprise fund? Professor, we're showing uh, question two, not question three. Oh, <laughs> no wonder. Okay, my bad. Um, okay, well with that, then let's look at this one, which I see why you guys were getting it right. And then I'll turn you loose on question three. Sorry about that. Okay, so we have what? We have landfill and it wants to know what expenses would be included in a portion of the expected disbursements, okay, when the landfill closes and what? Cost of final capping, and cost of equipment were on our flashcard, right? Okay, good. So everyone got that one, right? I apologize. Okay, question on that one? Okay, now let's look at this one and I'll let you do this one on your own.
Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and um, end this poll. And so, yeah, okay, most of us got it right. The answer is D. I'm a little surprised some folks still chose uh, still chose um, B, even though I had said that it wasn't B from the last when I made the mistake when we were looking at the previous question. But let's just take a look at this now. What I don't like about this question is they shouldn't test me. They shouldn't have me sitting here trying to imagine what these funds are doing, what these activities are doing to try to decide if it should be an enterprise fund. They should be testing me on the criteria. What's the criteria that constitutes an enterprise fund? Fees, right? Fees. Fees being used to what? cover costs, and if I borrowed money to establish it and I pledged the revenue, the net revenue, the fees to pay that back, then it's still coming back to fees, okay? Now, when you look at this, they don't mention anything about fees, but can you run a lottery where the government pays for the lottery? No, that's obviously what? Gonna have to be paid for through what? Through charging people, whatever. What do they charge for a lottery ticket now? A dollar? I don't know. You know, whatever it is they charge for a lottery ticket, that's what's got to be used, right? So you know, you know that it can't be A, and you know that it can't be C just by the logic of realizing that an operate uh, a lottery would have to be paid for out of the. Um, um, out of the charges to the users, right? So, I mean, it can't be, excuse me. Yeah, it can't be um, C and it can't be A, okay? Then you have to start saying, well, how does this hospital operate? Because some hospitals can be entirely government funded, right? I don't know. Or maybe they're being funded by a combination of tax resources and what? And fees. I don't know that from this question, but my safest bet then would to be what? Would to go ahead and say, well, since they didn't tell me about fees and since it's likely that when you go to a state hospital, it's not entirely free, they'll probably charge you something for some of the services that they're providing, then I'm gonna go ahead and choose D for that reason. But this question is not written very well, I have to admit. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's turn our attention to the fiduciary funds after the break. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and take a quick break here. And, um, I'm going to pause the recording and we'll come back in about 10 minutes, which I'm showing would be 632 guys recording. And um, there's some information up front where they, um, in the fiduciary fund category where they talk about fiduciary funds in general. I don't see that there's much use to that. Um, so I'm gonna just jump into the specifics of each of the type of fiduciary funds. Remember, we have three categories of funds. Fiduciary is our third category. And there are four um, funds that fall into the fiduciary fund category. Um, you know, most of the points come from the governmental funds. Some points come from the next level would be the enterprise funds, fiduciary funds, very light. And then we're going to talk about government wide reporting here when we get into chapter 10. That is, um, you know, sort of medium. The main area is those governmental funds as we've already talked about them. Okay. Now, when we come in and we talk about custodial funds, okay? And let's just go ahead and take a look at examples of custodial funds and tax collection fund, okay? So let's just use an example, okay? So let's say you have the city of Hayward here and um, you have a situation where you know the homeowners in the city of Hayward and they have to pay their property tax. Now, what they would do is they would pay their property tax to Alameda County. And it would be an Alameda County custodial fund, the tax collection fund. 
Okay, so this thousand dollars that's paid by the say is for the property tax is paid by the tax that paid by the property owner, excuse me, is not going to be paid to Hayward, it's paid to Alameda County. Okay, now when Alameda County gets that money, they are going to, and this is in the custodial fund, they obviously will debit cash for the thousand. Okay. It's a debit to cash for a thousand. Let me fix my arrow there. So, Blech. okay. Debit cash for a thousand. Okay. And then they're going to credit and they're going to credit an account called tax collected. or Hayward or other governments, whatever. Okay, but that is going to be reported on the income statement. And because the tax collection fund is gonna to get to keep some of this money, they'll go ahead and they'll credit say miscellaneous revenue. And that miscellaneous revenue then will be available for them to pay any expenses, et cetera, associated with this activity of collecting money for the cities within the county borders. Now, what's gonna happen? They're gonna go ahead and at the same time, they will debit an account called payments of tax, whatever, for 980 and credit due to Hayward because that money is not theirs, it's Hayward's money, right? So this is like a revenue, they call it an addition. It's like revenue though. This is like what? This is like an expense. They call it a deduction. Okay. And of course, due to is a liability. And of course, I'm not gonna tell you cash is an asset, right? Okay. All right, so with that in mind then, if you take a look at some of the things that we are going to see here for the um, financial statements, okay? And we have a statement of, for the custodial fund, we have the statement of fiduciary net position, custodial fund, you see cash, they might have some receivables, but then what? Notice that the money that they have is pretty much what due to other governments, okay? And then when you look at the income statement, which is a statement of changes in fiduciary net position, there's the money that they collected. There's that little bit of miscellaneous money they're gonna probably get to keep. The deductions, yeah, as they pay some administrative expenses, but most of their deduction is the payment of the money to the other funds, okay? That's the nature of the custodial fund. They're collecting money and they're doing what? Showing a revenue for that essentially, in addition for that, but at the end of the day, they end up paying it all out to the funds that they collected the money for. Okay? So the Skim that the custodial fund takes, does that, that, that doesn't show up as an, an, an expense, say, on the city of Hayward, because they, they never saw it, right? It was basically taken off the top, but it doesn't show up as an expense of the city of Hayward that they had to pay the custodial fund no. to pass it through. Okay. No, Hayward would have due from custodial fund and credit revenue of 980. 980. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now that's the custodial fund. There was one thing there that I wanted to uh, highlight in flashcard though. Special assessment, remember we talked about that? And if the government unit is not otherwise obligated for the debt, then it should be accounted for in the custodial fund. In other words, when these funds are just sort of doing a favor, collecting money on behalf of one party and then distributing it to another party, and they're not liable if one or the other party defaults, the paying party defaults, that gets accounted for in the uh, custodial fund. Cause they're just, think of the custodial fund as having two pockets, money in or one pocket, money in, reaching that pocket and what? 
money comes out. That's all they do. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and you take a look at um, the next fund, which is now going to be our investment trust fund. Okay. Now, when we look at the investment trust fund, I think it is useful to look at the investment trust fund from the standpoint of um, an example here. And so I'm going to exit this and I'm going to point you to one of the uh, slides, a couple of the slides that I have posted up there. Okay. And um, notice that it's used to account for the balance sheet and operating statement transactions affecting external participants of a centrally managed investment pool. And I'm gonna have you flashcard this in the book, but this is the big deal. Do not include investments held by the government unit managing the investment pool and allocate gains and losses proportionally. So these really are the two big takeaways about the investment trust fund. And to be honest with you, you could probably just pretty much look at these couple slides here to get everything you need about the investment trust fund for the exam. So in this little example, I've got Hayward, Union City and Fremont hold their respective investments, okay? And so Hayward has a T-bill, this is completely made up, fictional, has a T-bill, 500,000. And then Fremont and Union City have corporate stock, each having a fair market value of 200,000, okay? And then Alameda County has a T-bill and that's worth 100,000. So we have a total investment here of a million. And what happens is the uh, cities in, say, a county can decide to pool their investments because they save on transaction costs and whatnot, as opposed to each one of them having their own investment fund. So what happens? Each one gives their asset over to the trust fund to be managed there, okay? Over to the um, pool to be managed. Now, what happens? After that, Hayward gives up its right to the T-bill. So instead of having a T-bill bill on its balance sheet, now it shows investment in the Alameda County Investment Trust Fund of 500,000, which is a 50% share, 200,000 for Union City and Fremont, which each is a 20% share, okay? And then of course, uh, Alameda County itself has a 10% share because it's 100,000. Now, this is that key point that I had you from the previous page. I said, in the trust fund, only account for those investments that you hold externally. The entity that's actually managing this pool, which is Alameda County in this case, still carries that investment for that item that they have as part of that pool as an asset on their individual balance sheet. So when you look, notice that the Alameda County Investment Trust Fund now would show what? A T-bill of 500,000 corporate stock of 400,000. The T-bill, which I'm assuming was held by Alameda County's general fund, stays on the balance sheet of Alameda County's general fund. They do not put that as part of the assets of the investment trust fund, even though they're managing the whole pool as one pool, okay? Now, the other point about allocating gains and losses proportionately, and this gets a little scary, you gotta be careful who you get in these investment pools with because notice what happens if for some reason those stocks became worthless and there's now a four hundred thousand dollar loss because hayward held 50 percent of the assets in that trust they would have to absorb what 50 percent of that loss so they would have to absorb a loss of two hundred thousand whereas the other participants would take a less of a hit even if it was initially you know, an investment that was initially theirs that caused the loss. You allocate gains and losses proportionally after you put these items into these trust funds. Okay. Okay, good. So when you take a look back at the textbook now, and I'll go ahead and put it back in full screen mode. And again, you really could just use the slides for the key things. Okay. The revenues are considered additions, expenses are considered deductions. We value the assets at what? Value the assets at fair value. Flashcard that, go ahead and flashcard that. The assets of the investment trust fund are accounted for at fair value. 
And then, as I said, only report investments held by the uh, held externally. Okay, do not include those investments that are um, that are held by the manager of the fund. Okay, so right here, a government entity sponsors one or more external should report external portion, the external portion only. You can flashcard that, or you can look at that slide, and then you can put C. And it's, uh, what do they call it now? Multiple choice question. Zero, six, eight, one, eight. Zero, six, eight, one, eight. Let's just see if we're comfortable with that concept because I know it's not entirely, you know, something that you wake up in the morning feeling like you got a handle on it. So uh, let me do this. Yeah. It's always scary proposition to you know I'm scared to do it because I'm afraid if I put the computer out of tablet mode all hell's going to break loose so I'll tell you what just look at that question you'll see what I mean you're only going to include okay you know what Refuse to give me Neanderthal here. Okay. Let's just do, let's look at it. Zero six Okay, all right, good. This city of opulence maintains an investment pool to invest idle cash. The city extends the service to benefits its own funds as well as other governments. The invested assets would be accounted for as follows. The city owned funds are what? The assets of the investing fund. They're the assets of the general fund or whatever fund is actually holding those invested funds. The funds of other governments go into what? Go into the investment trust fund, right? Okay. Okay, good. Let me gently hold my breath. Let's see if I can get back. Okay, good. All right. Okay, good. Now, when you look at the private purpose trust fund, okay, and let's just look at for a second this uh, private purpose trust fund, which I give you a slide for that, which I think tells you all you need to know, okay? But let's just take a look at this one, okay? And a fund. I'm just going to read this slide to you. A fund in which the gift principles maintained or spent for the private purpose specified by the donor. The types of private purpose trust fund, college fund for cops kids. What does that mean? Well, let's say a police officer is killed in the line of duty or something. And this there's a not-for-profit organization that says, well, we're gonna provide you know, tuition money for kids because they had to grow up without a parent or something. And let's say the city says, look, this fund gets pretty big and the not-for-profit or whatever is having trouble you know, managing things. And the city says, we'll manage that for you. Well, that's a private purpose trust fund because what? It's not something that belongs to the city. It belongs to you know, the potential uh, children, the, the potential, you know, police officers, whatever, right? That would be accounted for in a private purpose trust fund. Unclaimed property, okay? What happens here? A cheap property. Let's say you have a bank account when you're a kid. Your grandmother sends you $500. Your parents have you open up a bank account. You open up this bank account, and then you forget about the bank account right? Your parents forget about it. You were five years old when you got it. You don't know about it. Can the bank keep that money? The bank has to take that money after a certain amount of time and they give it to the state. And then the state is supposed to look for you. Now they don't. 
What they do these days, at least in the state of California, is they have an unclaimed property site. And you can go to that unclaimed property site and you can look to see if there's anything in your name. Put in your name, put whatever city you think you were living in when you lost track of that money, and it'll come back and tell you if you have a hit. Around this time of year, holiday time, this is how I give out Christmas gifts. I go and look up people's names and say, hey, guess what? You got 50 bucks. I found for myself like almost a grand because I was using an impound account for to pay my uh, insurance and the insurance company had got a payment and then they acted like they couldn't find me. Meanwhile, I used the same insurance company for the first house and the second house. So I couldn't understand why they couldn't link those up, but they gave that money over to the state. And so I had to then claim that money through the state and it takes them about 180 days to get you that money, at least in the state of California. So all of that activity would be accounted for as what? As cheap property get accounted for in the private purpose trust fund. Now, as a practical matter, a substantial portion of street property will never be reclaimed. In light of this fact, governments typically retain only a portion of those resources to pay anticipated claims and use the balance in their operations. They just spend the money because they know almost no one's going to come and get that money. In that case, they set up a liability equal to the amount ultimately to be paid out to the claimants and recognize the balance as revenue because they know through their experience that nobody's going to ever come and claim that most of that money. And then um, sometimes to add insult to injury, they'll account for the entire SG property activity instead of in the private purpose trust fund. They just count for it in the general fund and just say, no one's coming to get this money. So you have an assignment, which is to go to the state of California unclaimed property site, put your name in there and see if you got any money and put my name in there to see if I have any money and let me know. Okay. Okay, good. That's really what the private purpose trust fund does. And there's not a whole heck of a lot more said in the outline or it's not presented in any manner that is any more helpful than that. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, move on to the pension, okay? Now, when you look at the pensions, okay? And when you look at pensions, the thing that is interesting to me, the way they ask questions about pension often, like often, one second, guys. Okay is they will ask about the revenue of the pension fund, but there, which is called addition, okay? For all the fiduciary funds, revenues are called additions, okay? And you'll have the employer and employee will make a contribution and that's seen as a contribution, right? An addition, okay? But most of the time, the questions that they ask, they ask about the contributing funds accounting, not the pension fund itself. So be careful, make sure you understand what fund they're asking you the information for. Usually they're asking you for the contributing fund. And if it was one of the governmental funds, they would debit expenditure when they contribute. If it was one of the other funds, then they're gonna debit expense, but they're not asking you here. I'm not showing you the journal entry of the pension fund. I'm showing you the journal entry of the fund that is contributing to the pension fund. And then when the pension fund pays out benefits, retirement benefits and whatnot, they're going to show that as a deduction. Okay, now that is the accounting of the pension fund and they're gonna account for their assets at fair value, okay? So you take a look, there's the investments, please, at fair value, don't give me any Enron stock in my pension, please, okay? So hopefully they're good, secure investments. And then you have the statement of changes in fiduciary net position, which additions are like revenues, deductions are like expenses, and the major expense obviously is gonna be benefits, okay? The major addition, these days, both employees and employers, and I heard something interesting this morning or this afternoon on the news, maybe it was this morning. Did you guys hear that San Francisco is saying they have a big surplus? 
And they're saying the reason we have a surplus is because of record earnings by the pension plan. So the city of San Francisco saying they have a surplus, they have money left over is because of earnings in the pension plan. What they're saying to you is because there was good returns in the pension plan, they did not have to contribute as much on behalf of their employees to meet the requirements of the in, uh, Employee and Retirement Income Security Act, the ERISA requirements. They didn't have to put as much in. I don't like that because when I hear that kind of shit, that's what happened back when the stock market crashed and when everything crashed in 2008, that they took these funding holidays where they didn't have to put anything in. And then when the stock market crashed, the actuaries told them, now you have to catch up. And then they said, oh, we can't afford these pensions anymore. And they start blaming it on you know, public service employees. They start blaming it on fire and police so they want to sit there and say, oh, we love you, fire. We love you, police. You, you're our heroes. And then when it comes time to contribute to their pension, they say, well, we don't want to contribute to the pension. Meanwhile, the reason they're having to pony up large amounts is that they take funding holidays when the market is good. So in my opinion, these funds to be managed properly should put cons consistent minimum amounts of funding in and not take into account, you know, ups and downs in the, to the market, but they do do that. And as a result, that's one of the reasons that they're saying the city of San Francisco has a big surplus. Statement of cash flows, again, only prepared by the, by the proprietary funds. Okay, all right, good. So with all that, Let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of questions and we'll wrap up chapter nine. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, end this poll and take a look at the answer to this question. And it looks like a um, good chunk of us got this right, which is option A. This is a custodial fund. And this is dealing with the situation. Um, let's just read through. Fish property owners in C County are responsible for a special assessment debt that arose from storm sewer project. If property owners default, C has no obligation regarding debt service, although it does bill property owners for the assessment and uses the monies it collects as to pay debt holders. What fund is that? That's the custodial fund. And for whatever reason, I don't know, everybody wanders away from that development and there's nobody there to pay those special assessments. It's not on the city to pay back the bondholders. Okay. Okay, good. Let's look at question two here.
Okay, guys, let's go ahead and look at this one. Looks like most of us had a chance to uh, try it. And um, so we go ahead and end the poll. And yeah, it looks pretty good. We got about 67% of us got it right. A few of us were thinking B. And I think that's, yeah, I mean, that would be the two logical ones here. So let's just go through this, though, and take a look. And um, the city of Ireland has these two. And they want to know, well, should any of these be a private purpose trust fund, right? And so forfeiture act cash confiscated from illegal activities, disbursements can be used only for law enforcement activities. So when you generate revenue, which is the cash confiscated from illegal activities, and then you earmark that revenue for a specific purpose, that is what? That's a special revenue fund. That's just like the gas tax that we talked about way back when we first learned about funds. You tax the gas, you use it for road improvement, okay? So that's not a private purpose trust fund. That's gonna be what? That's gonna be a special revenue fund. And then sales tax collected by Arlen to distribute to other governments, that's what? That's the custodial fund. So neither of these are private purpose trust fund. A couple of you wanted to pick that first one. And I could see why, because you're thinking, well, isn't this kind of like taking money and using it for the cops kids or something? But no, when we have money that was being used for the cops kids, that was what? That was a situation where we had this um, you know, private entity, and then they turned the money over to us, and then we use it for the cop kids, not for what? Not for law enforcement activities. No, it's being used for the benefit of somebody else. Law enforcement activities, that's meaning it's being used for an activity of the government. That means it's a special revenue fund. Question? Okay, good. So let's go ahead if there's nothing there. And let's see if we can do some damage to chapter 10 now. Okay. Now, as we get into chapter 10, guys, and we start talking about some of the stuff in here, we are really now talking about maybe five of those uh, 20 points that I keep talking about for governmental. Okay, so we are now going to spend some time trying to pick up a few key aspects of chapter 10. It'll help us to get most of these five points. But again, chapter eight, chapter nine, that is the central stuff that you've got to know from governmental with important focus on the, on the uh, governmental fund financial statements. Okay, if you can somehow Get yourself comfortable with that material, not somehow. If you do what I ask you to and you get yourself comfortable with that material, you're going to you know, be very happy with your results on your financial exam, okay? Okay, good, but let's go ahead and let's start to take a look. I'm not gonna give you a specific breakout of item by item here, but let's just take a look at our um, government-wide uh, reporting. Okay. And we have what? We have our, uh, let's just, let's just do this. We have our government wide statements. And the government wide statements use, let me, let me look at something. Hang on a minute, guys. I got a better idea. Um, hmm. Yeah, let's do it this way. I think this might be better. Come over and let's look at this. Rather than me do a funky drawing, why don't we use this? Okay, so here's the government wide statements. Okay, and government wide statements use operational accountability. Okay. Now, our governmental fund statements use fiscal accountability. Okay. 
Okay, and we're going to talk more about that um, when we go back here in a second. Okay, now what happens? We sit here and we consolidate our fund statements and we consolidate them into our government wide statements. And we have two columns we have governmental activities and business activities. Now in the governmental activities, we take the general fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, permanent fund, and the internal service fund, consolidate those together and report that in governmental activities. We put the internal service fund with the uh, governmental activities because the customer of the internal service fund are the other funds, right? Okay. Now, when we consolidate the enterprise funds, we consolidate them under business type activity. So that's just enterprise funds and governments could have several enterprise funds, the airport, the sewer, whatever, those go under business type activities, okay? Now, my KITPO funds, my fiduciary funds are not consolidated. And the reason they do that is because under the concept of operational accountability, how well you manage assets that belong to others is of no determination. So they don't consolidate the fiduciary fund. When you're trying to demonstrate a fiscal accountability, yeah, then what you're doing with funds that you hold on the behalf of others, like the investments, the pensions, that's going to be what? That's going to be accounted for at the fund level under um, a fiscal accountability focus, okay? Now, you come over back to the top, okay? And let's just take a look at what they say here. Operational accountability is the focus of the government-wide statements. Fiscal accountability is the focus of what? The fund statement. So you saw that, I wrote that on that uh, graphic, but you kind of see that I want you to flashcard back there because they could potentially ask you that, okay? Now, you come over and they show us the GASB reporting model. And if you are a state or local government, you have to prepare this. The first thing we see in the GASB reporting model is this management discussion and analysis. Management discussion and analysis is automatically required supplemental information, okay? Then that's the first thing you see. The second thing, that's a one. The first thing, the second thing you see are the basic financial statements. And the basic financial statements are the government-wide statements, the fund financial statements, and the notes there too. And then you have additional required supplement information. That's the third thing you see, which is not MDNA. So when you look at this model, it's consists, it's cons cons it consists of only two elements, required supplemental information, required supplemental information, or what? Basic financial statements. That's the only two things that are here. It just so happens that they require that we see the MDNA first as RSI. Then there's other things that they want you to provide as RSI, okay? Um, now, what does the word required mean? What is required? Must include. Yeah, not optional. Not optional. You got to do it, right? It is required. Okay, good. What does supplemental mean? Extra info. It adds on to something else, doesn't it? Well, what else is there to add to other than the basic financial statements? So when we look at the MDNA, when we look at required supplemental information other than MDNA, they are what? They're adding texture to the financial statements, aren't they? So they might be sitting there and saying, well, 
The reason there's a difference between what we budgeted for public safety and what we actually spent on public safety was because we had a rash of crime and we had to reprogram some money towards public safety that we hadn't before, or there was some sort of disaster and we needed money for COVID relief or something. So we reprogrammed some money that would be talked about in a narrative form in the MDNA and then in the government wide and the fund financial statements, you'd understand why all of a sudden there was so much more money put into say public safety, whatever. So they embellish, they add the required supplemental information, it adds to what you're seeing in the basic financial statements. Now, when you look at and flashcard that model, please. Flashcard the basic model and the order, one, two, three, okay? But they talk about this integrated approach. And this integrated approach is basically um, sitting there and describing that little arrow that goes back and forth. Okay. And so the integrated approach, just coming over the next page, requires a reconciliation of the fund financial statements to the government wide. Okay. And they tell us the reconciliation may appear on the face of the financial statements or in the notes. Flashcard that, but let's just pause for a second because most of what we're going to talk about here, guys, is a listing of requirements of what goes into the government-wide statement, what goes into the fund statement, some of the stuff we've already seen. Where we start going to have to use a calculator for some of this stuff comes into this reconciliation. So I'm just going to give you a very simple, silly example so that you understand how the reconciliation works, okay? And then once you see this, you'll be like, oh, okay, that's pretty easy. So let's say I have a government that purchases a police car for $1,000, okay? Now, if I'm accounting for this in, say, the general fund, what journal entry should I make for the purchase of $1,000? Of course, you can't buy a police car for $1,000, but just humor me. $1,000 for a piece of equipment, whatever. I'm going to pay cash for it out of the general fund. What journal entry should I make? Expenditure. Expenditure. Good. Debit expenditure for a thousand dollars and credit cash, cash right? For a thousand. Okay, good. Now, what happens? I need to account for this same transaction at the government wide level. Now, at government wide level, I'm doing what? I have to use full accrual accounting, don't I? So at the government wide level, I would follow my full accrual accounting training. I would debit equipment, $1,000 and credit the cash. Same transaction being accounted for one way at the governmental uh, fund level, the general fund level, another way at the government wide level. Now, let me ask you this, let's say this government had $100, $1,000 cash, and they spent it all on equipment. So when I prepared the balance sheet of the general fund, what am I going to see under assets? Cash. How much cash do I have? Zero. Zero. I don't have any liabilities. So my fund balance is how much? Zero. Zero. Okay, good. When I prepare my what? When I prepare my statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to show what? I'm going to show that I have um, revenues zero. I have expenditures of zero, and I have a change in fund balance. I mean, not of zero. Excuse me. I have expenditures of a thousand and I have a change in fund balance of what? Negative 1000. And of course, when I do my closing entries, I would have credited the expenditure, debited the fund balance, which would have brought the fund balance down from a thousand to zero, right? Which is how we ended up here. Okay. But the focus here is the balance sheet. Okay. Now on my uh, governmental fund statement of net position, which is like the balance sheet. Okay, like the balance sheet. This is now at the government-wide level. 
Do I have any cash? No. No. Cash is zero, but now I have what? Equipment. I have equipment of a thousand. My liabilities are still zero. zero. And sorry, I'm gonna have to write the net position down here. Net position is now a thousand, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Okay. Now, what Faz, uh, what Gatsby was looking at, they're saying, well, this could be confusing because you have a user of your financial statements looking at your fund balance of zero. Meanwhile, they're seeing a net position of a thousand at the government wide level. So what we would have to do is prepare a reconciliation. Okay, and that's what we're talking about here. And I'm gonna call this recon number one. We're the only ones that call it recon one and two. Okay, there's two reconciliations. Recon one reconciles the balance sheets. So in this reconciliation, I would start with fund balance. How much is my fund balance? Zero. Zero. And then I would come down and I would report net position, the government wide. And my net position at government wide is how much? A thousand. A thousand. And then I just have to explain the difference. And look, I'm going to write it like a Neanderthal man. They would write it more eloquently. The government would write it more eloquently, but I'm just going to say equipment. You know, they'd say something like equipment isn't reported at the fund level, but it is reported at the government one level, whatever. However they word it, they add back the thousand, don't they? And that shows the relationship now, that little double-headed arrow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now let's say there was some long-term debt here. Okay, long-term debt is not reported on the fund financial statements, but under full accrual accounting, let's say we reported $500 of long-term debt on the uh, government-wide uh, balance sheet. Well, then the net position would be how much? 500. 500. And then in the reconciliation, we'd have to say what? We'd have to show long-term debt. 500. We would subtract that. Net position would be 500, wouldn't it? Yep. Okay. So there's a few different things that are the differences between modified accrual and full accrual that would go into the generation of this reconciliation. And I'm going to show you more detail in the reconciliation later. But I just wanted to deal with that up front just so we understand. We have what? We have the basic financial statements, which is the government-wide statements, the fund financial statements, the notes, but also this reconciliation. Okay? Okay, good. Now you come over and I want you to make a flashcard here, guys. I need you to know the names of every single one of the financial statements that are prepared at these different levels, okay? So for the government-wide statements, it's the statement of net position and the statement of activities. Flashcard that, okay? For the fund financial statements, we have three categories of funds, don't we? For the what? For the governmental funds, it is a balance sheet and a statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance. I'm sure you got tired of hearing me say that over and over again, right, when we were looking at that. For the proprietary fund, statement of net position, statement of revenues, expenses, and change in fund net position. And they are the only ones that prepare a statement of cash flows. Okay. For my fiduciary funds, statement of fiduciary net position, which is like the balance sheet, and statement of changes in fiduciary net position. Unfortunately, there are questions that say, which of the following would be prepared by the governmental funds? And, you know, it becomes an easy question if you have this flashcard. It's a hard question if you don't. Okay. Now, remember. Yes. Um, even though the fiduciary funds are not consolidated into the government-wide financial statements, are they still presented as part of the GASB 34? Uh, yes. Okay. 
Thank yes, you. they're still presented as part of the fund financial statements, but they're not con consolidated government wide. So there's two levels of reporting going on, right? One trying to accomplish a fiscal accountability focus, the other, the government, that's the funds, the government wide trying to accomplish a uh, fisc, uh, ah, operational accountability focus. Okay, now we have the MDNA. Of course, the notes are always part of any set of financial statements. So, you know, let's remind ourselves that the government wide, all the way down to the notes, guys, is called the basic financial statements. And then we have RSI, which is what our MDNA is. And then we have RSI other than MDNA. And, you know, you can start getting into a bunch of things here, but let's just go ahead and take a look at budgetary comparison schedules as something that would be required supplemental information other than MDNA. It comes after the financial statements here, you stupid thing. Let's see. Okay, it doesn't want to let me. Okay, that's all right. Okay, so what happens? You sit here. Now, where are we? Okay, right here. Okay, so you sit here in budgetary comparison schedule. And let's say I have estimated revenue of 2 million. And then I have actual revenue of 1,800,000. Is that a budgetary comparison schedule? Not, the numbers aren't very well lined up there, but there it is. It's comparing my budget to my actual. That's the nature of the kind of things that will go into that required supplemental information other than MDNA that comes after the basic financial statements, okay? Now you take a look and there's other supplementary information, which is optional. And notice they say here variance between the budget and actual. And you're saying, but John, I thought you just told me that was part of the required supplemental information. That's not what I said. The variance, which in this example is what, 200,000? Like that? that variance, that variance column is optional. I know it's annoying, I know it's stupid, but that's basically what we're trying to say there. Okay, okay, good. Now, governments prepare comprehensive annual financial report. And look guys, it's an annual report is what it is. And um, it's like a phone book. I mean, it's ridiculous. It goes on for pages and pages and pages. If you're able to pick up city and county of San Francisco's comprehensive annual financial report, it goes on and on, okay? Now, it is the Government Finance Officers Association that tells us what we have to put in to our annual report. GFOA is not a standard setting body. But what happens is they give an award to state and local governments that follow their requirements. And if you're, you know, someone that's, you know, the CFO of the city and county of San Francisco, and this award has been won year after year after year, it's probably going to be written in your executive contract that you will continue to receive this award. And so governments adhere to this not because they're trying to follow GASB, but because they're trying to get the award and follow the GFOA. Sometimes I get students, I wouldn't care about the award. Yes, you would. If you're being compensated by the city and they tell you you're gonna get this award, you will care about it, okay? Now, what GFOA tells us is you have to have an introductory section and that introductory section has to have a letter of transmittal, organizational chart, list of principal officers, pictures. Have you ever met a politician that doesn't want their picture taken, at least in a good setting? Okay, and so what happens? That's that introductory section, okay? Now, and guys, I want you to just flashcard the headings here, okay? So there's an introductory section. Then there's a section that contains basic financial statements and required supplemental information. 
Does that sound familiar? That is that what? That GASB reporting model. So GASB says, look, state and local governments, you have to prepare this stuff. It's the GFOA that says, you know that stuff that GASB made you prepare? Well, we want you to pick it up and we want you to stick it into the middle of your comprehensive annual financial report. Now, sometimes students have trouble with this and I'm like, well, look, it doesn't bother you that a corporation has a nice glossy annual report where they have pictures of people sitting in boardrooms making important decisions. And then in the back, they put the financial statements that are required by the SEC and required by FASB and whatnot, right? And so government is kind of doing the same thing. They're sitting there and they have all these pictures and stuff. And then in the middle, they put what the standard setters tell them they have to prepare. And then there's this third section, and I just want you to put in here the headings on the flashcard. There's this third section that's the statistical section that is goes on and on. It's got 10 years worth of data about revenue, about borrowing, so that you can go back and answer any question about this government that you were afraid to ask, okay? And it's GFOA that says that they have to prepare this if they want that award. GASB is the one that's telling us we have to prepare this. And GFOA is saying, take your GASB requirements and stick them into the middle of this annual report. Question? Okay, good. Let's go ahead then. If there's no question, I've shown you that already. And so let's just take a look at this question. Ah, let's do it together, guys, to save a little time because it's like, hello. By the time I put up the poll, you already have this question answered. The statement of activities of government wide statement is designed primarily to provide information about what? Operational accountability of government wide. Yeah. Operational. Okay, good. I'll let you do this one on your own. <clears throat> okay guys i'm going to go ahead and um end the poll and um share the results with you here most of us got this right and they say which of the following <laughs> is what is true okay which means the rest of them are lies <laughs> okay and so what uh, the statistical section is not part of the basic financial statements. Basic financial statements is what? That financial section, right? The statistical section is its own section. Okay. Okay, good. Now let's come over and let's take a look at the um, financial reporting entity, okay? And so when we look at the financial reporting entity, what I want to do is I want to draw a highly technical picture here. Okay. Okay, now, when you look at this, um, we say that generally the financial reporting entity consists of the primary government. In this picture, P 
PG would be the primary government, okay? And organizations for which the primary government is accountable, which is called a component unit. I'm just gonna put CU since I drew this too small for a component unit, okay? So the primary government is the parent. The component unit is the child, right? Are parents financially accountable for their children? Try having one and tell the government you're not financially accountable for them and see what they tell you, okay? So what happens? Primary government, component unit are entities for which the primary government is financially accountable, okay? Now, when you look and, uh, yeah, darn it, darn, darn, darn. Um, let me do it this way. When you look at page 12, you have the primary government right here. There's our governmental activities, our business type activities, right? In our governmental activities, what's going to go in there? General fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, permanent fund, plus what? The internal service fund. Mm -hmm. What's going to go here? Enterprise. Enterprise fund. And here's the component units. These are entities for which the primary government is what? Financially accountable. And this so happens to be an example of discrete presentation. <clears throat> you write that discrete presentation. That's called discrete presentation, okay? So let's just take a look and see how we can determine if an entity is a component unit or a primary government because you've got to be one or the other. You've got to be one or the other. Okay, all government entities are one and let me click on it now. Okay, you got to be one or the other. I'm just going to go ahead and come back up the hard way. Okay, so you got to be one or the other. You're either a primary government or a component unit. Okay, so how do I know if I am a primary government? Okay, primary government. How do I know if I'm a primary government? State government is automatically considered primary government. So is the state of California a primary government? Yes. Is Rhode Island a primary government? Yes. Yes. Any general purpose government, city or county, is a primary government. Is the city of San Francisco a primary government? Is the city of Hayward, believe it or not, a primary government? Yes, because it's a general purpose, it's a city, right? Okay. Now, special purpose governments, such as a school district. Now they call it special purpose because it has a singular special purpose. What is the special purpose of a school district? I believe the children are the future, all that stuff. It's all about educating the children, isn't it? Okay. So that's a special purpose government. And for a special purpose government, they need to meet all of the following criteria to be considered a, a, uh, a primary government. They have to have a separately elected governing board. They have to be legally separate and fiscally independent. And we give you the mnemonic self there to help you remember the criteria for being a primary government when you are special purpose government. Now, if you're a special purpose government and you haven't met one of these criteria, what are you? Component unit. Good, good, excellent. So write down here governments that do not meet self criteria are automatically are automatically what 
component, component units. units. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and you take a look at component units. And I want you to create a flashcard. What two methods may be used to display component units on primary government's financial statements. I'm going to read that back to you. What two methods may be used to display component units on primary government's financial statements? What two methods may be used to display component units on primary government's financial statements? So remember, these component units are entities to which the primary government is financially accountable. There's two methods. One is discrete presentation. And so this is the answer to the flash part of the two methods. One is discrete, two is blended. Even though they've listed blended first, let's go to discrete. And discrete presentation is used when the criteria for blended are not met. Discrete presentation displays component units in a separate column. And most component units should use discrete. And I should have noted the page number where we were when I showed you discrete. What is that, page 12? Mm -hmm. Where I showed you the discrete presentation? Yeah, page 12. Page 12. So we can even put back up at where page eight. We can even put see page 12, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you should use most of the time. Now they tell us you can use blended when the, uh, you use blended, um, you use discrete when the criteria for blended are not met. So let's just flashcard the criteria for blended, okay? So some components are so intertwined that they are in substance the same. And I can't show you blended because blended it would be like showing you a milkshake and saying, well, here's the milk, here's the ice cream. Everything's mixed up together, right? And so you use blended if any of the following criteria, a board, the component unit is substantially the same. The component unit serves a primary government exclusively. The component unit is not a separate legal entity. Okay. Okay, good. So flashcard the criteria for blended and create this flashcard that calls out the two methods discrete blended. Now, let me give you an example question, then I'll answer any questions, okay? So the city of Hayward has a school district. The school district has a separately elected governing board, is legally separate from the city of Hayward, and each year must submit its budget to the Hayward City Council for approval. So is that school district a component unit or a primary government? Component unit. Because? It has to submit its budget for approval to um, the city of Hayward. Therefore, it's not fiscally independent, right? Exactly. And if you don't meet all of the self criteria, you are a component unit. Good. Now, since it's a component unit, it's gonna be presented on the financial statements of the city of Hayward, right? Should we use blended or discrete? Here's where I get confused. Well, uh, let's go through the question. Blended or discrete? And then you can ask the question. Well, it serves kids in Hayward. So it serves the primary government exclusively. No, it does not. It does not. It okay. serves the children of Hayward. So then I'd if say it was, it was discrete. some sort of some sort of entity that was there to like, uh, you know, cater to the board exclusively. Like it was sitting there and it's in charge of, you know, um, this component unit is in charge of running functions for the board or something, then it's serving the government. 
if it has a purpose that serves citizens, for example, then it's not serving the government, which is what a school district does. Okay. So if that's the case, it's not there just to serve the government, it's there to serve the citizens, the children, right? Okay, so then, then it would be discreet. Then it's going to be discreet because I said it had a separately elected board, so the right. boards are not the same. It's not there to serve the government, and uh, I think I said it was a separate legal entity. So my question is, if this is a component unit, and it's, and it's, if it, or it turns out to be a blended one, which fund does it does it get commingled with? Does it end up, does its financial results end up being smushed into one of the funds? Um, because it would have to be- not reporting component units at the fund level. We're reporting these component units um, at the, the, dis the, the discrete presentation of component units is showing at the government wide level. So then in addition to if adding blended, in the internal I'm service, we add it's in the blended Probably thing. governmental activities column. Okay. Okay, and it would be added in like the internal service fund is added in. Um, no, because the activity of, of these governmental funds probably is, again, trying to answer your question. Yeah. There is no component unit presentation at the fund level. So whatever funds account for this activity it happens out of those funds you ask me where is it i don't know it just depends on where you know what fund is paying this stuff right okay okay um we only tease out the component units at the government wide level and i'm thinking it's going to be in the governmental activities i can't think of a blended presentation that would affect the the business type activities it would be an enterprise fund yeah okay okay probably don't need to know more for the test. No, yeah. I mean, that's kind of beyond what you need to worry about at this point. Okay. All right, good. We've got the key flashcards here. Let's go ahead, though, and try our hand on this question three. I'll go ahead and let you try it. And it, I think you'll kind of see how they're asking this. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and stop this question because uh, I want to make sure I get to some things here tonight. Um, so, um, yeah, everyone got it right. That's discreet. That's almost like that little question I gave you. So the answer is B. Okay, all right, good. Now, let's come over and Let's just look at the government-wide statement of net position. That's like the balance sheet, okay? Net position format, okay? Remember, it's the difference. So if the assets are 100 and the liabilities are 80, our bottom line would be net position of 20, right? Okay, now note that this format, is encouraged for government wide and fiduciary 
I mean, and uh, and and um, God damn it, and proprietary funds. It says proprietary. It is encouraged for government wide and proprietary funds. That format is required for fiduciary funds. It is required for fiduciary funds and it's not allowed for the governmental funds. Governmental funds have to do use the gross up approach, right? Okay, okay, good. Now you come over and we have the same three categories of net assets that we saw for the proprietary funds, restricted, unrestricted, net invested in capital assets. So you can flashcard that again, but that flashcard of the three categories of net position, I should say, is consistent for our proprietary funds, for our fiduciary funds, and for our um, government-wide statements, restricted, unrestricted, net invested in capital assets. All right, now you come down and you see this statement of net position, right? Full accrual, long-term assets, the whole works are being shown to us here, right? Okay, now you come down and you have the liabilities and then you come down and there's the net position. Net position is the difference between the assets and the liabilities, right? Now I'm in, the business type activity column here that I'm showing you right now, right? Business type activity column. And when I look at this business type activity column, they show me net position of 1,835,000, okay? Now, you go over and I want you to, guys, and you're gonna have to uh, kind of be a little bit patient as I ask you to kind of turn some pages, okay? So I want you to put down and put C, page 26 and 27, okay? And what I'm gonna do is go ahead and see if I can find page 26 first off. And when I find page 26, notice I've come down now to my fund financial statements. I'm now looking at the statement of net position for my proprietary fund. So now I'm at that lower unconsolidated level, right? And I have a couple of enterprise funds, water and sewer and parking. When I add those two together, I now have the total of my enterprise funds, don't I? And when I come down to the bottom, assets, current and non-current, liabilities, current and non-current, and I come down and I see the total net position of 1,835,000. Is that that same number? So we didn't lie when we said that we consolidated to come up to the government-wide level. And so when you circle that number 180, 1,835,000, you could put C page 13, because it takes us back to page 13, where we're now back up at the what? At the government wide level and showing you the consolidation, right? With me so far. Now, you can't, trying to do that with the governmental funds is going to be a little more interesting. Okay, so here's my what gov my governmental activities, I should say, column. See that? That's showing me the net position now of my governmental activities. And what I want you to write here is C page, and this time you're going to go to C page 23 and 24. C page 23 and 24. And when I come over to page 23 and 24 now, Okay. Now notice I'm in my governmental funds, right? I've drilled back down to the unconsolidated 
fund level, and here's my governmental funds, okay? And when I come down and it's only current assets, it's only current liabilities. And when I come down to my what? Fund balance, remember the non-spendable fund balance for inventory, remember we had that whole discussion last time? When I come down, the total fund balance is 4,195,000. Is that that same number that we were looking for before? What were we looking for? We were looking for 3,730,000. This thing's saying 4,195,000, isn't it? Okay. So now when I look, I got to find my page here. Okay. Now when I look, I have to go and you can put down here, C page 36. Okay. And so when I go over to page 36, what I have down here at the bottom of page 36 is, and you can go ahead and label this as recon. Number one, okay. And notice that million, that number 4,195,000 now um, on page um, 36. That was that what? That number that we saw. Eh. What page was that number on, guys? 24. Thank you. Huh? 2024. Thank you. That was that number that we saw on page 24. And then notice it reconciles to what? Now that's the number we were looking for on page 13, wasn't it? Mm hmm. And this is the reconciliation. So it starts with fund balance. And what do they do? They add the purchase of capital items, they subtract long term debt. In this particular example, there was some amounts that they had taken as what? They had taken as a um, deferred inflow at the fund level, but they took it as a revenue at the government wide level. So they go ahead and they add that back. And then they bring in the internal service fund. So now you can look at the internal service fund and for the internal service fund, mm -hmm. um, you could tell us to see page yet. Uh, see page, where was my enterprise fund guys? I tried to get this right today. Was it page 39? Let's try that. See page 39. I think that's right. And when you come over and you come down a few pages to page 39. No, swing and a miss there. Uh, where is my damn enterprise fund now? Uh, 27. Uh, 27? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, page 27 here, when you look at page 27, thank you. When you look at page 27, you can see that we have what? We have the net position of the, and here now, even though we're on the statement of the um, proprietary funds, notice, I'm picking up the internal service fund here's mm -hmm. net position of 163,000. And when I stick that into the reconciliation, what page was the reconciliation on, on page what? 36. Thank you. See page 36. And now when I look at page 36,
I see where that 163,000 came from. And so now I have this thing reconciled because I started with fund balance. That's only governmental funds. I bring in the fixed assets. I subtract out the long-term debt. If there was anything that was being accounted for as a deferred inflow at the governmental fund level because the collection of the revenue fell 60, outside 60 days, then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to have to add that because that would have ended up being reported in the net position if it had been taken as a revenue under full approval accounting at the government wide level. I bring in the internal service fund and the thing reconciles. Okay. Now, most questions that you're going to get are not going to be this comprehensive. So, what I want to do is see if I can find really quickly here a very straightforward, easy reconciliation question. Um, you know what? Let's finish. This is a good thing to finish with. It's not that easy, but I think it's a good exercise for us to do together. And then we're going to have to stop and uh, talk about what our game plan is going forward here. Okay, but let's look at this example. Okay, and this is recon one, because you're going to reconcile the balance sheet, you're going to reconcile the income statement. This would be the balance sheet, the statement in that position. They give us all this information. And then they want me to prepare the reconciliation. So when you look, they start out with what? The total of the governmental funds. So you come down and you look at the solution. You start with that. You start with the total governmental funds. And I don't think you need this mnemonic. I really don't. Then you go in and you say, well, I have to add in the capital assets, don't I? So you bring in the 2 million, okay? But remember, you're not reporting the accumulated depreciation at the fund level, but you would report that at the government wide level. If you're gonna report the assets, you have to report the accumulated depreciation, don't you? So I subtract that out. Then they had long-term debt. So I have to go ahead and subtract out that long-term debt, right? <laughs> and then I keep reading and they tell me, internal service fund net position, I know I got to pick that up, right? We just did that. That was that 163,000 that I couldn't find, okay, to get the right answer. Now, what's maybe more important about this is what? What you leave behind. Don't pick up proprietary funds because that's including what? Both the enterprise fund and the internal service fund. And the enterprise fund is in the business type activity column, isn't it? Be careful. Don't pick up the fiduciary funds because they are not consolidated, right? Question. Again, I don't think you're going to get comprehensive questions on the reconciliation. You'll get a multiple choice question that'll ask you maybe one or two items, reconciling items, and you'll be in good shape, okay? Now, I wanna stop there. And I want to talk to you about what we're going to do going forward. We had agreed last time that we would do two consecutive Wednesdays, the 22nd and the 29th. Do you still want to do that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. So what we'll do on the 22nd is I'm going to quickly look through uh, with you a couple of things that I wish I had got to tonight, but it is what it is from chapter 10. I'm not going to crush chapter 10 because I want to move <laughs> on to get us into the final review next time. We'll do that on Wednesday, the 22nd, and we'll do that again on the 29th. I am going to be sending them a message to leave everything open for you through we said, what did we agree to? June, May, June? Okay, so I'm gonna leave everything open for you through June. Um, and I'll, if you can't make it these last two sessions, I will be posting the recordings for those, okay? Make sure you are turning in your CPA planning test, tent planning document and your guest speaker write-up. I gotta get those. I must get those. Those are the only deliverables for you in this class, but you got to turn those in. If you don't turn them in, I'm not going to pass you in the, cl in the class. So you need to turn those in. Questions?
I have a question about whether or not in all of this shuffling, since the governmental funds don't put the assets and the debt on their balance sheet, if they buy something, does that stuff ever get lost and the gover it doesn't make it into the governmental wide? Like what's the control so that it doesn't it doesn't fail to end up in the government wide financials? They would have to have subsidiary documents that would keep track of the assets and stuff that they have, right? And the government wide entity would have privy to those, would, would have access to all that then, right? Well, they're the same entity. Oh, okay. It's one entity. It's the city of San Francisco. And what they would do, Kathy, is when they prepare their, um, their financial statements, right? On the, um, say I'm doing the, the government-wide statements, mm -hmm. I mean the fund statements. Yeah. So they record everything at the fund level. Okay. So if I purchased equipment, right, I've had expenditure of $1,000 showing, right? So would they have expenditure categories Let that would make it easy question. to figure out? Um, answer the question. I'm sorry. So if we have the fund, we have an expenditure showing of $1,000, right? Okay. And then what we'll have, and, and that's where we would have recorded it. We would have mm -hmm. recorded it at the fund level as an expenditure, right? Okay, and there's my expenditure showing on my statement of revenues, expenditures, and changing fund balance. And then I'll have a worksheet. And on this worksheet, there'll be debits and credits. Okay. And what I'll do is I'll debit and I'll create the account equipment. And I'll debit it for a thousand. And I'll credit the expense for a thousand. And so when I get to the government wide level now, what I'll show is what? Equipment, right, of a thousand. And my expenses on my statement of activities are gonna be what? Are gonna be zero. Mm -hmm. So they report things at what? At, they, they record things, I should say, initially at the fund level. Mm -hmm. And then they do a worksheet consolidation to convert fund statements to government-wide. So in answering your question, they need to maintain the data to be able to do this. Okay. If, if they can't do this, they fucked up, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what it would constitute, a mistake. You have to be able to do this, however they capture that data. And I'm thinking at some sort of subsidiary level. Now, I see literature sometimes that says they could have two GLs, a government-wide GL and a fund GL in which they account for things at the fund. You know what? That would be a disaster because you would never be able to get the two to reconcile. Because if you have two different GLs, two different systems, the reality of accounting is that the systems don't capture the same data. And if you don't believe me, go and look at the consolidated financial statements of the federal government in which they try to have two different systems. And guess what? They can't get the balance sheet to balance because both systems aren't capturing the same information. So they end up plugging about $3 trillion to make the government-wide balance sheet balance because they can't get the individual agency statements to talk to and be consistent with the government-wide statements. So the way you do this is the way we've been trained as accountants record at the individual company slash fund level, convert, consolidate to the consolidated company wide, government wide. And that's how they do this. But you got to have the information to allow you to do that. Yeah, I was wondering, I noticed that in the textbook, a lot of times there was a considerable amount of detail to the account titles. And I'm wondering if that isn't also how they help keep track of it. Like, um, instead of just equipment, it would be like equipment, police cars for the Petrero Hill Division, or you know what I'm saying? So they, that, so that there'd be a lot of detail to the account titles so they'd know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. No, there's got to be proper inventory control, asset control records, et cetera. We're not getting away with all any of that. Because unlike the federal government, they will have to receive an unqualified opinion if they want to continue to issue, you know, uh, state and local government bonds 
Oh, and yeah. so they're going to have to, the federal government gets a disclaimer of opinion on their financial statements every year. And every Tuesday, people line up to buy treasury securities. Why? Because it's the biggest, baddest government the, entity, the world has ever known. And if you don't believe me, go ahead and try to take something from them sometime. Okay, <laughs> so, you know, so people are comfortable still buying federal government securities, even though they can't get the set of consolidated financial statements with a clean opinion. That would not happen for state and local governments. So they got to take the educated approach and I'm pointing to my screen here now, they've got to do it this way. Start at the fund level, convert, consolidate to the government wide level. And there's a whole exercise that we probably won't get to in the back that does exactly that. The back of this chapter shows you entry by entry, uh, item by item, how you would make entries on the worksheet to consolidate, convert from fund level to government wide level. And it's worthwhile looking at that. We won't have time to do it together. Well, maybe we will, I'll try. But I, I'd much rather spend some more time talking to you about other areas because I still want to cover a little bit about bonds. And I want to cover a little bit about leases because we didn't really do that at all. And those are a couple of areas that sometimes students are a little concerned about. And so I want to leave us some time to do that in the final reviews. Uh, classes. Thank you. Okay, guys, we will see you next time. I would say have a happy holiday, but we'll see you before then. Okay, so I will see you on the 22nd, 22nd. That's a Wednesday. We moved it up a day because folks have holiday. People are daring to enjoy the holiday um, a little bit before, um, the, you know, on the 23rd. So we'll move, push that to the 22nd, same thing. We'll do the other one on the 29th. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Night.